Well, folks across many parts of the country might be getting a little bit of a breather from significant flooding and severe weather here that we saw throughout last week, or at least getting a reprieve from more rain falling anyway. Still a lot of cleanup that's going to have to happen. Let's talk about some of this historic flooding and what the weather pattern looks like as we move into the week ahead and beyond. Eric Stodgrass with Nutrient Ag Solutions joins us for our weekly weather update. And Eric, uh, just some of the pictures we've seen, some of the uh, radar estimated totals of rainfall from Arkansas up through the Ohio River Valley here over the last several days. Uh, just so impressive in totals anyway, and just devastating when you take a look at a lot of these pictures. And that's not even including all these massive tornadoes and more that we saw, Eric. Yeah, so I mean, just to put this into context, you have a lot of places throughout the Mid-South that just received anywhere between a quarter and a third of their annual rainfall inside of about 10 days. So just to put that in perspective, that, I mean, that is a tremendous amount of water and the flooding is going to continue as the rivers crest later on this week. And uh, this is going to be, uh, this is an, an absolutely devastating event and it costs up several lives. Uh, in addition to that, a lot of uh, agricultural problems. We lost a lot of topsoil with this. There's going to be major nitrogen issues. We hit a winter wheat crop in the mid south that uh, needed to be, you know, harvested soon. And uh, well, not quite, you know, but coming up, and we just hammered it with a bunch of water. Um, and uh, this was this was terrible. This was a terrible event. And what it was was a stagnant pattern, right? We had a big Bermuda high. We had a stalled out front of the mid south, and it just systems followed it. Now there was a plus side to this. And it definitely wasn't the severe weather, which the end of March, beginning of April has started off with just I mean, loads and loads of, of tornadic events, hail, straight line wind. We're way above in all three categories on the year. But there was a benefit because that pressure trough slowed down over the Mid-South. The system, the big one this past weekend, it was forced to slow down as it came out of the Southern Plains. So we have filled in some important gaps in New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma parts of Kansas, parts of Nebraska that were deep in drought. Oh, and don't forget up north, we had some snow. So in North and South Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin, that's all snow that when you see the temperatures, which are going to warm up this week, we're going to melt that snow. And the frost line has already been driven down 20 to 40 inches. We get to keep it. So this is, this is incredibly unpleasant and a terrible event for the Mid-South. But on the whole, for agriculture as a broader view, these systems outside of the Mid-South were incredibly beneficial to the rest of the country. Now, that being said, there's no way to kind of understate how devastating this was for the Mid-South in terms of flooding when you start hearing totals of 15 plus inches of rainfall inside of just a few days. So won't forget this one anytime soon. We definitely will not. And we're going to continue to see those fallouts and impacts here uh, as we move forward. Now, as we shift to this week, a much calmer weather pattern, but we also got much cooler temperatures to deal with across many areas. Eric, talk about that. Yeah, so the wet weather is going to be driven largely to the um, eastern side of the state and behind, or excuse me, eastern side of the country and behind us some pretty cold air is coming in. You just kind of look at the frost line that's going to be happening early this week. It's dipping down there into the Mid-South. It's going to hit parts of maybe parts of North Carolina, maybe as far south as, uh, you know, sections of, uh, uh, you know, I think, I think a big chunk of Texas is going to touch a frost temperature as well, in addition to other parts of the South. And as a result of this, um, this is a very late frost event. We're two to three weeks behind what our climatological averages would be for way down South in the United States. And, uh, but you know, it's all short lived. We're going to blast in warmer temperatures very soon. Uh, in fact, parts of the central plains later on this week, we'll see temperatures in the eighties. So like, welcome, welcome to the U S I mean, it just <laughs> flies around like that. And these temperatures just change so quickly. Uh, but the question is going to be Jesse is with all of the heat coming back to the plains at times, well, I think the Eastern side of the country maybe hangs on to some cooler weather longer, the water that just came back, do we evaporate a lot of it? Do we lose a lot of it? Do we build back in some longer term risk on, on, uh, you know, on drought redeveloping. And then the other side of this is, I mentioned that the Eastern United States stays, stays cooler. You know, uh, where I live in Champaign, Illinois, we are at, um, you know, our average last frost date is 10 days from now. That's our average. Do we have the risk of a late April or early May, you know, frost event? That's hard to predict out there that far, but I'm telling you, I don't think we're quite done with all the cool weather yet in the Eastern Corn Belt. But I think there's gonna be a big warm up coming to the Western Corn Belt. It's gonna stick around for a while. 
Well, let's talk a little farther out. I know some new seasonal models have come out, Eric. Maybe you can give us some details on that. Uh, just what are we looking at? Maybe a little bit of a longer term picture for the U.S. weather this summer. Yeah, so some of the kind of the really big news that was released last week was that Colorado State University released its new long range outlook. This is what they do to predict hurricanes. OK, I used the same analogs that they came up with to try to predict where the summer weather pattern is going to be for the Midwest. And here's the years that they've chosen. 1996, 1999, 2006, 2008, 2011, and 2017. Now, what's interesting about all of those years is that by the time they got into July, almost the entire Corn Belt was hotter than average. And much of the Western Corn Belt was very dry. Now, the Eastern Corn Belt, the Great Lakes states, ridge riding storms, they were in good shape. But when you look at all those years in composite, that's what, that's what happened. Now, what helped drive this was a shifting around of the Bermuda High, and the precursor to that was colder water showing up in the Gulf of Alaska, colder water showing up off the Baja of California. And when we see these areas beginning to do that, it gives us this risk of having these dry conditions in the midsection of the United States and the risk of heat. Now, the new long-range European model, which was just released today, doesn't agree with this fully. They keep more of that heat in the Great Basin. They keep less moisture, but not nearly as dry as some of the analogs would be for the central U.S. And I think it's because this particular model was not initialized well. It was initialized during the, the beginning of April, which was a super chaotic week. You know, the model was started then, and then it tries to predict knowing that that's where it's initially beginning. You know, the second thing was, is that the new European model just made the whole North Pacific warm, like the whole summer, just really, really warm compared to averages. And it's not that way now. We have a fading La Nina right now. It's going to be in so neutral this summer. And uh, I, I don't buy it. So I'm going to stick with the analog maps, which you just showed, as I think the um, I think maybe our, our midsummer risk. And it is a risk of dryness and it's a risk of heat. And that's the wrong recipe if it lasts for a long time in the midsection of the country. It's definitely something that we're going to have to continue to follow week by week and, and have the conversation about as things evolve here as we get into this summer. Eric, how about South America as we take a look at things in Brazil and Argentina? Any big updates uh, in South America right now? Well, it's forecast to be quite dry in Argentina, but remember, it's fall, right? And and, and their, their crop calendar is more similar to the U.S. than Brazil's is, but it's not. I mean, they have a long, long, long planting season and, you know, it's what's different. But their forecast be pretty dry going forward. Where we were thinking there was going to be a problem in early April, now this is way back in March, we were thinking this, was going to be in Brazil's eastern growing areas. But it's raining there and the forecast is wet. And I don't have any major problems in Mato Grosso, Mato Grosso do Sul, Parna. I mean, all the way down to Rio Grande do Sul, I don't see widespread problems on this safrina crop. So whereas we kind of had some hope that we were going to see something shifting around, that could give us a little bit of a spark about the time we're getting this crop planted in the U.S. Uh, Brazil's not necessarily giving us that uh, that supply side you know shock we thought we could get. Eric, any other updates from around the world before we close it out here today? Anything yeah. else you're watching? It's always this is always in the back of my head, but I got asked over the weekend why is 2012 not in your analog package, and I was like, wait a minute, it is in my analog package. It's it is a year of which 2025 looks similar to you. So, well, what's similar about it? Well, the, the shape of the warm water north of Hawaii, the cooler water that's been at times off the west coast of the United States, the fading La Nina, and the warm up that's off of the west coast of South America, that all happened in 2012, almost in the same kind of sequence. So this is what I'm going to encourage you to do. Okay, on my website, agweather.com, ag-wx.com, you can watch my forecast video from this morning. If you don't care about the near-term stuff, which is what we just talked about, Go to the end of that video and watch me compare the long range European run to those analog years. And I toss in 2012 so that you know what we're watching for. Should we get ourselves into a rapid onset drought development scenario late June, July through August? So we'll put it out there so you know what to watch. It does not mean it's a slam dunk. That's what's going to happen. But there's just a lot of moving pieces that have some similarities to some rough years. So we can't ignore it. Find all those details, links to the forecast videos and more, agweather.com, ag-wx.com. For more information, always a pleasure and enjoy it. Eric Snodgrass, Nutrient Ag Solutions. 
Thanks for being with us for our weekly weather update this week. Have a good one. We will talk to you next week. All right. Sounds good, Jesse. Thanks.